right, we are in Paul's second letter and final letter that he wrote to anyone that we know, his letter to Timothy. And he knows, though God has delivered him from many sticky situations over the years, it's probably time now for him to go home to heaven. And he's writing to his beloved friend, his, uh, his protege, his friend, his uh, fellow minister in the gospel, Timothy. And Timothy, of course, would be very distraught because he wouldn't have Paul around to encourage him anymore. And, 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 Paul's over, and Timothy's overseeing the church of Jesus Christ in the city of Ephesus in what we would today call Western Turkey, and the church had a lot of problems. There were false teachers leading people astray, and, and Timothy tends to be sort of an anxious, kind of a timid person, kind of shy perhaps. It, it, it's hard for him. And last week, we, we looked at uh, the beginning of chapter 2, or we looked at chapter 2, verse 8 and following, where we're, we find out that remembering, we said remembering what God has done for us is important for our spiritual health. We said, you know, God throughout the Old Testament, institutes the, these, these things for pe- his people to remember what he's done for them, like the Passover meal. And, and, and God's people would remember every year when they ate that meal, they'd remember how God had spared the Israelites from the death of the firstborn by the blood of the Passover lamb over their doors. And, of course, the Lord's Supper, where we always are remembering that Jesus gave up his body and blood for our salvation. And we also said last week that the reason God comes up with ways for us to remember how he saved us is because we tend to forget. We're we're, we're just like that. We tend to forget. And remember, last week in verse 8, Paul had said to Timothy, Remember, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Now, the Christ crucified as our substitute been raised from the dead, and God said, I accept that sacrifice and through which we are saved. And, and Paul, Paul's saying, listen, Timothy, after I'm gone, you keep preaching the same message of Christ crucified, Christ raised from the dead. Don't change anything. You're, you're, you're surrounded now, and in the future you'll be surrounded by false teachers, and they're going to want to take the message and change it or twist it, but don't listen to them. You guard the gospel that's been entrusted to you. And he's saying this, you know, every which way but Friday throughout this whole letter. And then we get to verses 11 through 13, which is where we'll be today, where Paul is going to quote from an early Christian hymn or a poem uh, to reinforce what he's just been saying. So go ahead if you haven't already. Open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And verse 11 He starts off by saying, the saying is trustworthy. And Paul uses this phrase in his letters when he's quoting someone. And he's putting his stamp of approval. He's saying, look, you're familiar with these words. Let me tell you that they are very much true. And what follows here in these verses may have been part of an early uh, baptismal service or a hymn or a poem No one knows for sure, but these are words that the early Christians would have been familiar with. And then Paul then quotes four couplets. And we'll look at the first couplet at the end of verse 11. He says, if we have died with him, we'll also live with him. And that's almost identical with what Paul wrote to the Romans uh, in Romans chapter 6, verse 8. He said, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And, and there's this, this teaching in the New Testament that we were crucified with Christ 2,000 years ago. And we were resurrected with Christ 2,000 years ago. We are identified with him. And this is, see, this is talking about our mystical union with Christ in his death and resurrection. So what this means is that your death to sin is an accomplished fact. I mean, if you died with Christ 2,000 years ago, you are dead to sin. Uh, the, you will not face the penalty of sin. Uh, you're separated from the power of sin. You may still have strong sinful desires. We all do. But sin is not your boss. It can't make you do anything anymore. And, and we're also, we live for him and live with him. In the future, that means we're all going to share in Christ's glory in the resurrection. But even now, we live with Jesus 
by the power of the resurrection now. He holds us up. He keeps us in the faith. It's like this illustration I've used before. If you have, you've got the book, you've got this Bible, and you've got a piece of paper. If I put this piece of paper in the book, I mean, the, the paper is still a piece of paper, but I put it in this book, and then you could say wherever this book goes, the paper goes. So you and I are, here we are physically alive, and yet, because we're in Christ, we were crucified with Christ 2,000 years ago. And Christ was raised from the dead. And even though we are not yet in our resurrection bodies, yet in a sense it's already an accomplished fact because we are in Christ. We're identified with him. And that's what Paul's talking about here in this first couplet. We, we are completely delivered from sin and, and the power of sin, and, and there's no, we're not facing a terrible judgment. And then the second couplet, when you get to verse 12, he says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. Now the word endure here is the same word as Paul used back in verse 10, where he said, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. I I put up with time in prison, or beatings, or sleepless nights, or difficult roads to travel on, because everywhere I go and proclaim the gospel, there's men and women and boys and girls who are going to put their faith in Jesus. So I, I endure. I, I hang in there. And so what he's saying, in other words, if we are trusting in Jesus Christ in this fallen world, if we are his, and, you know, we, we feel like our home is heaven. A lot of times we don't feel quite like we fit here. If we're enduring, uh, enduring suffering, then we will also reign with him, just as Christ suffered and now he reigns the same we will experience the same thing at the right time look at the screen at Romans 8 verses uh, 16 through 18 and and Paul says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And then he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And, and you know, the, the grammar form here, if, if we are trusting in, if we are, you know, trusting in Christ, if we endure, we'll also reign with him. You know, that's the sense of that is it's expected. Paul's saying this is what it's like to be a Christian. You know, we're identified with Christ. We're part of his body. And we live in a fallen world that does not appreciate us. And sometimes things are hard. But ultimately, if we're in Christ, we will reign with him. And, and you can't even compare. I mean, the future is so much more glorious. It's more good than the worst day here is bad. It, it's, it's wonderful. It's like, uh, I've told you this story before of the official ending of World War II when uh, the documents of surrender were finally signed by Japanese uh, and the designated representatives of the Allied forces on September 2nd, 1945. And, you know, General Douglas MacArthur on the USS Missouri was sort of the the head guy there. And there was a time when he was the last guy to sign the, the, the conditions of surrender. And when it was time to sign on behalf of the United States, he signed his first name with his his Parker fountain pen, Douglas. But then he did something that no one expected him to do or no one had ever seen before. He then took that pen and he passed it to another uh, United States general uh, named General Wainwright, who had been a POW under the Japanese and suffered horribly. And Wainwright then signed Mac and then passed the fountain Parker pen to another uh, general, General Percival, who also had been a POW under the Japanese and suffered, and he wrote Arthur. So the, the three of them together wrote Douglas MacArthur, and that was the official end of World War II. And th- what MacArthur was doing in passing the pen is he wanted to honor these two generals who had suffered so much in the cause for victory. And now that victory had come, you know, they, they get to share in the celebration with MacArthur. They had persevered. They had endured, and now they were allowed to share in the glory of victory. And that's what Paul's really talking about here in Romans chapter 8. He's saying, look, you know, we are co-heirs with Christ now, and, and we struggle. We struggle. We're, we're tempted to sin. Uh, there's opposition to the gospel. 
It's in this, this fallen world is just hard at times. But one day we can be sure, now that we share in his sufferings, we'll one day share in his glory. It's a certain thing. Like we, Christ gives us a throne to reign on with him. We like signing the, the victory papers because we're in Christ. Jesus endured suffering on our behalf, and now he's glorified and seated at the right hand of the Father. And because we're in Christ through faith, he enables us to persevere, to keep trusting in him, despite the difficulties of life and opposition or headaches. It's sort of like the communion table down here. You, know, you see there's, there's a cross here, there's candles on here. Gravity right now is pushing those things toward the ground. Gravity always goes in one direction. But the reason those items don't fall down into the ground is because the table is underneath them and holds them up. The reason you and I are able to endure, to keep on believing in Jesus Christ, is because the Holy Spirit himself holds us up. We live in a world, a sinful world, where the gravity of this life is always pulling people down. But the grace of God holds us up so we endure, and then eventually we reign with Christ. That's a promise to us. Um, now look at the screen again at a very familiar passage in Revelation chapter 3, the last book of the Bible. This is uh, Jesus talking. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Then he says, The one who conquers, I will grant him, or you could say I will grant her, to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, when he says we're going to conquer, the one who conquers, he doesn't mean we conquer like a Greek mythological hero. We go out on a long, an odyssey, a long journey, and we fight uh, you know, monsters and, and dragons, and then we come back and we've earned our place. No, he doesn't mean that at all. He says we, we conquer sin and death and evil, by believing that Jesus Christ has already conquered sin and death and evil for us. That's our conquering is done by trusting in the one who really did the conquering. We conquer through faith in Christ, and then we will reign with Christ. But it's all about faith. Those of you who are old enough may remember a great baseball player named Reggie Jackson. He played in the majors from 1967 to 1987. Played for the Yankees, the Oakland A's, and a couple other teams. And his nickname was Mr. October. And he got his nickname because I mean, he was a great athlete, but he would really shine in the playoffs and eventually in the World Series. When he got up to bat in the playoffs, there was a good chance the ball was going to go over the fence. Mr. October. And once uh, somebody was talking to him in an interview, and, and, and Jackson said, well, you know, he lived for the postseason because he knew he was going to shine. But, of course, in order to get to the postseason, one has to first participate in the regular season. And his secret to shining in the regular season was that he was always looking forward to the postseason. And in a similar way, uh, we play the regular season. We're here in this world, trusting in Christ, believing his promises, believing we're forgiven, that he's coming back for us. And yet, you know, we, we live in a world where not everyone believes that. Uh, not everybody on TV is going to affirm what you believe. There are some people who may scorn you, uh, but yet we, we believe. And so we're playing the regular season now because we're looking ahead to the postseason glory. We know what's going to happen. Well, Christ is coming back. And that gives us endurance right now. That's why you know, Paul keeps saying to Timothy, look, you, you've seen me suffering. It bothers you. I'm in a dungeon right now. But listen, Timothy. It's all worth it because I know where I'm going. And I know the people that have come to faith because I've been preaching. The same with you, Timothy. You keep playing in the regular season because the postseason's coming. Now, we are identified with Christ in his endurance and suffering, and we're also identified with his reign, like the, you know, the paper in the book. And, and we will be, the Bible says, like kings and queens, honored best friends with God's Son. I don't know if I ever told you this story before or not, but I had a next-door neighbor when I was a kid, when I was in grade school. The family was named the Harbos. Now, Harbo is, is a Danish name. And the, the, the father was named Ernst, Ernst Harbo. And, you know, I, I lived next to him for, I don't know, eight, nine years, you know, when, when, 
in New Jersey. We lived next to each other, and I just thought he was Ernst. I, I was friends with his sons, you know, didn't think much about it. Well, then I, I came upon his obituary. Oh, I just a couple years ago I found it. I mean, he had died years ago, but, you know, with the Internet, you suddenly think, hey, I wonder whatever became of so-and-so. Sometimes you find information. It turns out that when Ernst Harbo was growing up in Denmark, he had fought for a little while uh, in, the, in the underground against the Germans, but what was really striking to me is, as a kid, he was best friends with the crown prince of Denmark. I had no idea. I thought it was just Ernst's baby living next door, you know. I, he was the father of some friends of mine. But Ernst used to, and he once took a, before World War II, he took a trip around the world with the crown prince of Denmark. I thought, wow, he, he had some real connections there. And I didn't even know it. You know, you and I just look like regular folks living in this world. But man, do we have the connections because we're friends with Jesus Christ the crown prince who's going to rule over a whole new world and we're going to reign with him. And it's by faith that we hang in there. Well, let's put Matthew chapter 25 on the screen. And Jesus, here's Jesus, what he will say to us in the future. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. And I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. You've been faithful over a little. I mean, we're, we're just little people, aren't we? We're little people living in a little town, and most folks around the world aren't reading about us or know much about us. You know, we, 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 we follow Jesus. You know, we, hopefully the way we, as parents, as aunts and uncles, as grandparents, as talking to people we work with, you know, friendship, neighbor. You know, we, we minister in little ways to the people around us doing things at church, but Jesus will say to you one day, you were faithful in little things, I'm going to put you in charge of a whole lot of things. Enter into the joy of your master. See, that's all. It's just a matter, it's, it's what Christ has accomplished for us on the cross. And Christian, any Christian who's willing to endure difficulties for the sake of the gospel now, now are, are those who believe in the certainty of, of the gospel promises of everlasting blessedness. The more your confidence in the promises of God, what our future is like, the more those, that confidence is elevated, the more joyfully you'll be willing to suffer difficulties or frustration or, or love people who don't love you back or be kind to folks who aren't particularly kind to you, to pray for people who maybe don't seem to care about you or your Jesus at all, but you pray for them anyway. And the more we're thinking about where we're headed, the more free we are to serve other people. And just so you know, God is at work in you right now to elevate your confidence in those gospel promises. God is always working in us, day and night, to give us more of a, a deep faith in all that he's promised in his word. Now, in, our, in, in this little uh, this poem or this hymn that Paul quotes from, there's a third couplet when you get to the end of verse 12. And this sounds a little bit more ominous. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And the word deny means to renounce or disown or repudiate. It sounds a lot like Matthew chapter 10, where Pastor Nick was just reading. We'll put that on the screen too. Okay, well, just to refresh our memories. So everyone who acknowledges me, says Jesus, before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. I used to read this as a young Christian, and this scared me halfway. To, the, to tell you the truth, to this very day, whenever I read this, I kind of wince a little bit, you know. I mean, th these, are, these are pretty strong words. But you need to know that they are not written to terrify Christians. These words are written to warn people that to finally reject Jesus as Lord and Savior is to be rejected by God forever in a final horrible judgment. Now, the thing is, though, if you're like me, when you read these words, whether in Matthew or, or here in 2 Timothy, you start recalling the times in the past when you did deny Jesus, or at least you, you pretended uh, like you were not a Christian, or you were afraid of what people would think of you, or maybe at times you just get afraid, like I do, 
that I will deny Jesus in the future. And I, mean, I don't know how you can read those words and they not cross your mind. But let's look at the experience of the Apostle Peter. I mean, he was, he was a believer. And man, did anyone ever deny Jesus like Peter? I mean, Peter was cussing and swearing and saying out loud, I do not know him. I did not spend time with him. I mean, it was a bold-faced lie because he got scared. I mean, he denied Jesus thoroughly, and then, you know, the rooster crowed, and he felt like such a schmuck. He felt horrible. But then after the resurrection, you know, Jesus found Peter, and, you know, three times he forgives him, and then he reinstates him, and Peter became a wonderful shepherd of God's people because he knew what it was like to fail and to be forgiven. I mean, he was a true shepherd, a true pastor. Now, if you ever deny Jesus or fail to speak up when you could have, you, know, you will feel badly, but when that happens, run to the cross where you will find forgiveness and that your denial of Jesus is washed away and is forgotten forever. See, Peter, Peter did something really bad. But he stuck around Jesus. Jesus found him and reinstated him. See, Judas Iscariot disowned the Lord too. But he walked away and never came back. He, he did not have faith. See, you will discover that when you run to the cross, that your father does not reject you, but welcomes you to himself as his own dear child. And the Lord Jesus himself puts his arm around you and gladly claims you with great pride as his little brother or sister that's because Jesus died for our denial on the cross. That's because he endured suffering on our behalf because you and I never would have endured. Now, see, the people who will be disowned by Christ are those who walk away and they never, ever come back. Now, there's one more couplet here. And this, this, is, this is wonderful news. Verse 13, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So what a, what a wonderful comfort to us after the, the, the scary words in the previous couplet. Now, this, verse 13, is not a warning. It is a promise. In fact, I, it's almost surprising this is in the Bible. You know, it's so easy. I, I bet you ask most people that you know, you know, what's the Bible about? The, most people think, well, the Bible is about, you know, what God wants us to do and how if we don't live good enough, we're going to get in trouble and go to hell. You know, we're, if God's in anger, we're going to be in trouble with God. But I mean, most people don't even have any idea this is in the Bible. If we are faithless, even if we really mess up, even if we really fail in the Christian life, he remains faithful to us. You know, we may at times temporarily run away from Jesus. Uh, and we are certainly, none of us, are as loyal to Jesus day in and day out as we should be. And many of us and have gone through a period of time when we were not walking with the Lord. Before we were Christians, and even for many, maybe most of us, even after we became Christians, there may have been a period of time where we just kind of you know, drifted off into Never Never Land for a while. We are often a lot more concerned about how we're doing and our own interests than we are about God's interests. And all of us have probably done some things, even as Christians, that are downright embarrassing. We probably all have at least a little bit, some kind of a skeleton in the closet. We prefer just to stay in the closet. But see, the good news is that God is faithful to you even when you've been disloyal to him. Uh, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. There's all kinds of characters in the Bible. We already mentioned Peter. And you think of Jacob, the grandson of Abraham. Jacob, who is, you know, one of the early patriarchs and ancestor of Jesus. And he was such a, a slippery, sneaky, <laughs> deceitful guy. He said, what, how can anything good ever come from, out of him? But he believed in the promises of God, and God worked in him and worked in him and changed him. There's, then there's Jonah. I mean, Jonah was not subtle in the way he disobeyed God. God said, you see, Nineveh over there, go preach to them. And then Jonah said, you see Spain over there, that's where I'm going. He jumped on a boat to Spain. 
and, and he was trying to go in the opposite direction. But what did God in his faithfulness do? Jonah is being so unfaithful, yet God sends a storm, has Jonah thrown overboard, he's swallowed by a fish, he's spit up on land, he winds up in Nineveh. Because God was faithful to him, even in some very unfaithful moments of Jonah. And of course, uh, King David, the ancestor of Jesus Christ, who committed murder and, 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 and scandal, in the, in the, and even though God had said to him, Look, you're going to have a son who's going to reign on a throne forever and ever, looking to Christ, and yet he still committed adultery and murder. But even when he was faithless, God remained faithful to him because God will not deny himself. John Calvin points out, he, he, looking at John 5, verse 22, where Jesus said, all judgment has been entrusted from the Father to me. And your first thought might be, oh boy, Jesus the judge. Oh man, how scary to stand before the judge. But think about, th th those words are meant for unbelievers, they are scary. But for the Christian, they're encouraging. Because when you stand on the day of judgment before Jesus, he's going to show you the holes in his hands and the holes in his feet. And then the, the hole in the side. And you're going to say, I'm the judge, but I did this for you. I went through hell for you. I suffered your place so that you're free and you're forgiven forever and ever. Our judge is so for us. If our judge is for us, then who's ever going to condemn us? We're not going to face you know, our hanging judge. We're facing the one that was willing to be tortured to death so you could be his forever. Now, that final judgment for the believer is going to go really, really well, even if at times we've been faithless. See, as a Christian, the Bible says you're part of Christ's body. I mean, he, Christ can't disown himself. I mean, do you ever disown your finger or cut off your toe or try to get rid of your elbow or something? No, you, you want to protect yourself. Jesus, is we're part of his body. We're his fingers and elbows and toes and, and arms. He's not going to disown himself and cut, our, cut us off. No, we're his. We belong to him. See, Christ's loyalty to you does not depend upon your faithfulness to him. Christ's loyalty to you depends on his faithfulness for you. And, and Jesus met all the conditions of faithfulness and loyalty. He did it for us. He was perfectly faithful because he knew we never would be. He did it for us. And the Father sees that and credits that to us, to you, to you. And, and Jesus paid the penalty for all of our unfaithfulness. It's all washed away. When Samuel Rutherford, the Puritan pastor, was like in prison, he was under house arrest sort of for two years in Scotland because uh, the, the government authorities didn't want him to preach anymore. And so he was suffering, and he wrote to a friend while he was in prison. He said, often and often... I have in my foolishness torn up my copy of God's covenant with me. In other words, he's saying, sometimes I'd be so frustrated with God, so disappointed. Here I am, I can't preach, I'm, I'm in prison, and, and, and the promises of God seem so unreal. He's saying God's covenant, like the promises of the New Testament. It's like I want to tear them and just rip them up and say, oh, they're not going to happen for me. God's not faithful. But then he said, but blessed be God's name, he keeps the covenant in heaven safe, and he stands by it always. It's like he said, I tear it up down on earth, but the original copy of God's covenant with me in Christ is preserved in heaven, and it's written in the blood of Jesus, and so he remains faithful to me even when I've been unfaithful to him. See, these are the promises of the gospel. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're glad you remain faithful because sometimes we are faithless. Sometimes we have no idea what we're doing. Sometimes, Father, our minds are on a million different things besides you. But Father, we thank you for the promises in Christ. 